Good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to the dialogues on nonviolence, religion, and uh, peace. My name is Asher Kaufman, and I'm the director of the John B. Kroc Institute for International uh, Peace Studies. This event is taking place, place on the traditional homelands of uh, native peoples, particularly the Pokagan Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education and for other life giving purposes for thousands of years and continue to do so. As we gather here for this, uh, <clears throat> for this lecture and dialogue, it is important to acknowledge our own place in the story and practices of colonialism and our responsibilities, not only uh, to make this gesture of land acknowledgement, but also to reflect on Notre Dame past, present, and the future relationship with the Pokagan, the original stewards of this land and uh, to actively pursue ways to amend this uh, troubled relationship. <clears throat> this is the 26th day year in which the Kroc Institute hosts this event, which has been enabled by the generous gift of Anne-Marie Yoder and her family. We started this day with a breakfast with the, the extended Yoder Maust mayor family who are here with us. So thank you for your continued support for this uh, a lecture a series. The Dialogues of Nonviolence and Religion and Peace are one of the signature public events of the Kroc Institute. In the past, we have had the range of speakers who led these dialogues, from academics such as uh, Jean Sharp, Erika Chenoweth, uh, Miroslav Wolf, and Robert Orsi, last year's uh, speaker, to practitioners such as uh, Ricardo Esquivia, founding director of Hustapas in Colombia, Jean Zaru, the Palestinian peace activist and the author, Professor Azza Karam, Secretary General of Religion for Peace, and the Tekla Namachanja, Acting Chair of the Truth and Justice, Justice and Reconciliation Commission of uh, Kenya. To this list of distinguished uh, thinker, thinkers and activists, we add today Dr. Uh, Tracy uh, West. Please welcome me. I would like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Todd uh, Whitmore, Professor of Moral Theology and Christian Ethics and a valuable faculty fellow of, and a longtime friend of the Kroc Institute to introduce the Dr. West. And then we will add another round of applause to Dr. West. Please. Thank you, Asher. It was a cold February in 2019 when I, by the way, pre-COVID, this is, this is a statement about the longevity of our friendship that predates COVID. When I and the other editors of a new book series that combined social ethics, ethnography, and theology reached out to the Reverend Dr. Tracy West to see if she might be interested in joining us in leading the series. Her book, Solidarity and Defiant Spirituality, Africana Lessons on Religion, Racism, and Ending Gender Violence, had just come out. And its combination of passion, compassion, and rigor blew me away. In the book, Dr. West takes as her starting point her concern about gender-based violence against Black women and girls. Part of the reason is statistical. In her words, in general, most studies have found that black females experience intimate partner violence, rapes and sexual assaults at higher rates than white females. However, what drives much of the statistical disparity is a social disvaluing of women and girls of color. There are, again, in her words, standard associations of evil, sin and ignorance with darkness. Black women and girls stand at the vulnerable intersection between misogyny and anti-Black racism. In an effort to learn how to better resist gender-based violence against Black women and girls, Reverend Dr. West travels to Ghana, Brazil, and South Africa to learn from anti-violence activists in these locales. 
And Reverend Dr. West's methods hold more than hold up to scrutiny from the social science perspective. She interviewed 180 people in three countries, with 75 of those interviews being two-hour, one-on-one exchanges. In keeping with her methodological seriousness, Reverend Dr. West engages the wider ethnographic literature, and here not only on the topic of gender-based violence, but on doing on the doing of ethnography more generally. Even though her rigor is, first of all, based on the number and extent of her interviews, Reverend Dr. West understands that those interviews are not simply a matter of gathering data to present in an abstracted way. Therefore, she presents the interviews as moments of encounter between different, even if in some ways overlapping, worlds. To do this, she appropriates the anthropological method of participant observation, or what she prefers to call a participatory method of learning of the interview encounter. And the written result is a kind of thick description of the encounters. One review in the sociology journal uh, describes solidarity and defiant spirituality as a daring and creative work. Another review, this one in an anthropology journal, states, quote, West's careful study spans multiple fields and demographics, resulting in a text that elegantly models the conceptual themes of solidarity and defiance. Anthropologists will appreciate how her methods challenge the notion of the field. A theologian writing in such a way where sociologists and anthropologists not only listen, but laud the work? Who wouldn't want her on her edit our editorial board? And an editorial board would want someone with both passion and rigor. But what I also want to point to today is the compassion that she has brought. She started us in the practice of what she understatedly calls checking in at the beginning of each of our meetings. And her openness and her vulnerability has us talking about everything from grants won to loved ones lost. I just want you to know, before I go into a select list of her professional accomplishments, about that Tracy West. Her other single author works include Disruptive Christian Ethics, When Racism and Women's Lives Matter in 2006, Wounds of the Spirit, Black Women, Violence and Resistance Ethics, 1999. Her articles are simply too many to mention. She received her BA from Yale University, her Master's of Divinity from Pacific School of Religion, and her PhD from Union Theological Seminary. She is an ordained elder in the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church and has served in campus and parish ministry in the Hartford, Connecticut area. She has testified before the New Jersey State Legislature in support of marriage equality, protested on behalf of LGBTQ equality at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, and received Auburn Seminary's inaugural Walter Wink Scholar Activist Award. And yes, she has been since February 2019, a co-editor and much loved colleague for the book series, TNT Clark Studies in Social Ethics, Ethnography and Theologies. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Tracy C. West. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I'm so appreciative and um, a little overwhelmed. And uh, I, I don't think I have seen some of those reviews. So that's, that's also a lovely surprise. Um, really terrific. So thank you. Uh, begin with my thank yous to Todd. And uh, thank you so much uh, to the uh, Kroc Institute. Uh, thank you, Asher and uh, 
thank you um, to the Yoder family and uh, especially to uh, Aaron and to Ari, uh, who met with me several times. Sometimes you invite a speaker and they can be a little, uh, you know, labor intensive. And so I think I was one of those speakers uh, that I just kept saying, are you sure that you want me? I'm a black, like hardcore anti-racist coming to all red Indiana. I work on sexual violence, including talking about the legacy of John Yoder. Are you sure you want me to speak at this event? And they just kept assuring me, absolutely, absolutely. So I want to lean into um, the fact that we will have dialogue. Um, I will push some boundaries and some, some go to some uncomfortable places, but we will have dialogue and you'll be able to push back and give another perspective. And I'm counting on that. Uh, today, I just, I wanna focus on, um, on method, on problematizing method. Uh, what I like to say, to put it another way, I wanna focus on intentionally on the really sticky, really smelly, really difficult problem places. And the kinds of sub issues I would like to talk about, which uh, some of which we can get to in more detail uh, in, a, in a discussion, but I wanna start with talking about conflict over trigger warning, um, and how that reveals, what that reveals about the politics of race and gender. I wanna um, to, to, to just give some sense of, of the elements that I include in my anti-violence black feminist ethics method. Uh, then I wanna talk about how denial of violence, what happens when denial of violence uh, really uh, kind of equals uh, notions of uh, Christian ethics and peace and love. I wanna emphasize today, especially Christian ethics and especially uh, the US context. Uh, so I'm really grateful for that introduction because for the most part, I'm not talking about my trans, uh, I'm not talking about my transnational work. And then an example of histories of racist gender violence uh, and how they expose the hypocrisies that I'd like to see undermined. Probably won't get to it, but I wanted to at least note uh, one element that's really crucial in, in, in transnational solidarity, which is what I explore so much in that in this study, the most recent study that I did, and that's translation skills, particularly cultural translation skills. And, and then just emphasize in closing uh, just the, the gift of having a freed up imagination. Uh, that's why uh, I think it's so important to spend so much time on uh, anti-racist, uh, uh, on an anti-racist method um, that hopefully leads to anti-racist gender justice. Um, so uh, once uh, a few years ago, I was teaching a Christian social ethics class uh, that I call Strategies of Social Protest. And I played an audio tape uh, podcast clip with sounds that included really hateful, just despicable, hateful anti-transgender statements by local community leaders in a certain setting and a description of anti-transgender based violence. Uh, as well as really angry uh, protest against these harmful words and actions. So I'm in Indiana. Have you heard of some kinds of anti-trans kind of mobilization here, right? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Theme that politicians here have picked up big time. So I, so I played this, this tape um, and immediately after I played that clip in the class, we had an extremely fraught, conflict-ridden, tense conversations about trigger alerts. And it made a deep impression on me because of how powerfully revealing it was about the dynamics of anti-gender violence work. 
several students in the class openly identified as transgender, as non-binary, or um, several students use the phrase, they have an expansive gender identity. So an expansive gender identity. And those students, those trans students came from a range of national and racial and cultural backgrounds. And a few of the trans and non-binary students um, who were upset by that clip, or they witnessed one student who was particularly upset by that clip, trans student, um, they interrupted the class. They interrupted the discussion I began to lead. I started to ask the students questions about particularly the public protests and some of the ethical issues that arose in the public protests um, in, that, in that case study I wanted us to think about uh, related to this form of gender violence, anti-trans uh, violence as a form of gender violence. The students who interrupted me admonished me that I had failed to give a trigger warning. And I did. I had failed to do so. And uh, I, um, beforehand, and I admitted my omission. And I took time in the class to allow some of the discussion, some discussion of issues of vulnerability, of the painfulness of the experience for most, uh, for the most socially vulnerable members in our class, the trans and non-binary students, uh, most socially vulnerable in relationship to the hate and anti-trans violence that we had collectively listened to in this clip. But I did not apologize for including the upsetting example of anti-transgender violence. At this point, the tension in the class was palpable. There was a range of annoyance with me to really serious anger at me. And there was a range of annoyance and anger directed from students to the students who had raised the concern. And uh, th the dynamics were infused with race. The students angriest at me happened to be white, and several of those angriest at the ones who raised the concern happened to be students of color. So you're following me? Right. So I got a range of trans students but the students who were angriest at me were white, white trans students. And there were uh, mainly cisgender students of color who didn't like that sort of attack um, coming at me and what got raised. Um, you know, in this class, the strategies of social protest class, we had been watching videos and discussing assigned readings throughout the whole semester that include very brutal, brutal white racist beatings, white racist sexual assaults of African-Americans. And, and given that this is Gender Violence Matters to me, specific readings on sexual assault of African-American children by white racists, particularly in the aftermath of the uh, Brown versus uh, Board of Education integration decision by the Supreme Court. So the, the course really focused a lot on the 1950s and 60s civil rights movement. And I had not offered a trigger warning for those images or those stories that we had read and no one had requested it. The conflict over my failure to offer a trigger warning about Christian anti-trans hate and gender-based violence had surfaced so many really, really important dynamics. The trans students' feelings that they needed to advocate for each other, needing to press the cisgender, me, cisgender professor, and the cisgender students to see them, to see them, and the trauma anti-transgender violence induced as something that impacted them right there in the classroom. It surfaced the tacit acceptance by the, by the class 
of the histories, because we've focused so much on civil rights movement, the histories of anti-Black racist hate and racist violence, including gender-based sexual violence, as something that was not trauma-inducing. And, and by their omission, there was this dynamic that the white students somehow had introduced the idea that what had happened was not trauma-inducing. All of that hung in the air, all of those dynamics and much more. The conversation about warnings helped me to recognize how much it matters what you bring, what knowledge you bring. That is the knowledge you bring about vulnerability to the threat and reality of being targeted for gender violence. That knowledge you bring based on vulnerability that you are accustomed to experiencing, that you are accustomed to witnessing, that you are accustomed to remembering, that you are accustomed to forgetting. This determines the kind of ethical issues we're able to discern related to gender violence and anti-gender violence. You see how I'm not making a claim about individualistic self-care? I'm not saying self-care is not important. I know, I, know, I know some of you are saying, are you saying it's not important? It's very important. Self-care is very important. Um, but the, the conflict-ridden trigger warden warning discussion illustrated here how the ethical process of discernment is always a social process. It's always a social process, deeply informed by the communal histories we bring, specifically the group process of racialization the group process of racialization, racism pivots, right? On racialization, all of a sudden, the dynamic, the identity, the individual, the policy, the interaction, the group, the projection into the future, the memory all gets racialized. So pivots on this process of racialization fundamentally shapes the hardened, coercive, oppositional gender binaries, gender hierarchies, gendered erasures of human worth that fuel gender violence, and so therefore must be confronted. The sometimes triggering, sometimes triggering, always awfully painful, awful painfulness of the targeting can't be avoided indeed must not be avoided in the pursuit of anti-gender violence work. So in my black feminist method, okay, uh, not, not just a focus on method, but obsession with method, I am centrally interested in questions of how racist Christian hypocrisies that fuel gender are sustained. How are they sustained? You see the method process question, how are they sustained? For me, we need an anti-racist approach to gender violence that's centered on discomforting, disrupting of the smooth over the tension in the room and get to the hope and the love and the peace and the unity, right? Never traumatizing, I hope, not traumatizing, I hope, so hear me, hear me, but always discomforting um, and, and embodiment and how embodiment, a focus on embodiment, the intimate use of bodies for control and humiliation demonstrates how personal and political commitments are inseparable, right? That act of uh, using bodies for control and humiliation, that's a political act. 
That's always a political act. I don't care if there's just two people in the room. That is politics, right? So the focus on body allows us to see how those are inseparable and experiential, of course reveals interdependence of the universal and the particular values. If you focus on the experiential, it helps you to realize that universal and the particular are always, always, always intertwined and informed. But I want to just take a second here and say, how about you? How are you going to help me? I'm going to invite you to help me uh, with articulating method. So you got a card and what I wanna invite you to do, and I'm just gonna give you a moment to do it. <clears throat> um, and that is to help me think about in an anti-racist approach, how do our ethical values enable the work of ending gender violence? That's my question. In an anti-racist approach, right? So in an anti-racist approach. How do our ethical values enable the work of ending gender violence? So the prep I was given about this audience, you need to know, is this is a 201 group. So don't go for the 101. This is a 201 group. So I'm trying to up my game by inviting you to write two words on your card, two words. I want a verb and a noun. You're allowed to confer, but you just got a moment to do it. A verb and a noun. What's a verb? How, do you know, you, what, how do you define a verb? Do we have any English people? Action? Yeah, some, some kind of action, doing, right? Some kind of action. You can use a, you can, can you cheat and use a gerund? Yes, you can, it's fine. And a noun. So write something down, anything, please. And I'm going to collect one of my collectors. Okay. So think about anti racist approach. How do our values enable? The values must. What's the verb? Jot it down, please. You can confer, but just anything, anything that comes to mind. It just helps us and it helps us. But they'll use must with a verb. Anything. And then a noun. A noun is uh What's the definition of a noun? Person, place, person, place, or thing, person, place, or thing. Okay, H hand them, pass them to the aisles. I, I haven't even started my talk, so you have to. We have to help each other to do this tough thinking. Um, I, in an audience of thousands of people, I still do this um, because because it we're working together, we're thinking it through. I I don't know the answer, but we together can do this creative work to create, right? So. An anti-racist approach to gender violence involves an anti-gender violence approach to anti-racism. All right, I'm gonna say that one more time because you probably didn't catch it. So an anti-racist approach to gender violence can involve an anti-gender violence approach. In other words, anti-gender violence tools. The work of doing anti-gender violence gives us tools 
that help us to think through anti-racism. One of the most fundamental ways that white racist hypocrisies are maintained in the most popular expressions of US-based Christian ethics, as well as the nerdiest scholarly expressions of Christian ethics, is in the insistence on separating ethical principles such as peacemaking, right? So I'm getting under your skin here, but it's only the beginning of how I'm going to get under your skin. Peacemaking and neighbor love. I, I put those together because often neighbor love is seen as the motivation for peacemaking. Um, so the separation of principles from particular contexts, particular practices, particular histories that in fact generate the need for peacemaking and neighbor love, right? So this disassociation is is this disjunction. It it, it can school us in a a collective what I want to call a collective coercive control mentality, right? It's a collective coercive control abuser mentality. So you get schooled in this way of thinking, right? Um, and, and forcing Christian white supremacist hypocrisies. I can't resist mentioning a really quick case in point. I wanna say something about today and where I am and how it gives us opportunities to think about this. Uh, so today is April 4th, right? And I can't resist mentioning the anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. as a case in point of a willed collective denial in the service of white racism. Most US Americans, when they commemorate, if they commemorate, I don't know, is Indiana one of those states where you don't come up? You do, you do come up. You do, okay, all right, sorry, 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 just not sure. Um, um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s January 15th, right? Birthday, um, doing it on his birthday. And usually a celebration of, he had a dream, Martin Luther King had a dream of the universal notion of human equality, devoid of any mention, devoid of any mention of anti-racism, anti-poverty, anti-war social movements in which he was one of the leaders. And unsurprisingly, this decontextualized universalistic understanding of Martin Luther King Jr. as a dreamer about equality is now used by right-wing politicians to suppress the teaching of racism and to suppress teachers who teach about racism. Uh, case in point, really quick mention, U.S. Senator uh, Ted Cruz, remember when he was questioning, um, if you follow U.S. politics, which I do, um, uh, racial politics, when he was questioning um, Katanji Brown, um, Justice Katanji Brown, um, cited Reverend, Dar Mar Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of a world where children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, right? As a reason why uh, Justice Brown should not support the studying of critical race theory, of, of theories of racism. And, and I wanna say, if we focused on learning from April 4, instead of January 15th, we would have to focus on the hatred and the violence of which he was a target. You know, in 1968, just before King's assassination, over 70, a Gallup poll, only over 75% of the US hated Martin Luther King. Over 75% hated, hated Martin Luther King Jr. We would have to focus on how his life was taken, how he was murdered because of leading mass protests, nonviolent direct action. So many of my students say, yes, Martin Luther King was in favor of nonviolence. And they leave out the direct action part. Like, oh, no, 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 no. Those two go together. They go together. But no mistake that that gets left out. Um, that those campaigns called out the hypocrisies in US Christian practices for their supposed commitments to peace and neighbor love in local communities. By forgetting April 4th, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., we learn to disregard the enormity and potency of nationalist white racist violence and hatred embedded in US culture. You can completely erase that violence, erase that the costs, the costs of protesting US Christian white supremacy's violent global expressions, such as his public protest of the war in Vietnam directly preceding his assassination. The erasure of that 
we imbibe a memory instead that there was no violent white racist threat that was delivered on April 4th. That threat delivered on April 4th to all those who would similarly protest and similar, similarly question and be part of movements against such hypocrisies. I am a crazy person if I interrupt the narrative that King was a dreamer who dreamt and believed in the principle of equality. That's who King was. If I interrupt that narrative and talk about that vicious hate, 75% of the US, right? I'm a crazy person. That is classic gaslighting abuser logic at its best. Now, because I am here at Notre Dame, where Christian ethicist John Howard Yoder taught, and the debates about the legacy, sorry, um, and the debates about the legacy of, of his sexual violence and ideas about peacemaking are so germane to the methodological goals I'm pursuing here of challenging hypocrisy that covers up the harms of gender violence. I'm going to briefly note, but I have to note the importance, the importance of the inseparability of ethical ideas from personal violence. Now, there is so much debate going on in among Christian ethicists, um, including a panel, uh, an example, a quick example of a panel um, organized at the Society of Christian Ethics um, about the legacy of, of John Howard Yoder and, and the sexual violence. Karen Guth organized it. And, and an extremely well-known and extremely well-known and revered uh, Christian ethics scholar um, um, stood up on this panel and noted how Yoder's acts of sexual abuse was a complexity that should not alter our appreciation of his ideas about peacemaking. And this person noted in a kind of classical Niburian equivocating way that sexual abuse was a demonstration of the inevitability of sinfulness. Now, I know this is a sensitive topic, but I just want to say that I was also on that panel and I disagreed with that perspective. And I want to point to another discussion, another perspective that's also part of the discussion in, in Christian social ethics. Um, and that's by, um, by, by Scarcella and Kriebel. They have this article about sexual violence and theology where they argue we should not talk about and read a lot of um, the legacy, a lot of the words of, of John Howard Yoder, that his sexual violence drove a considerable portion of people out of theology and, and the church, and their voices are lost, and therefore we should not preserve Yoder's voice. He, because thought and action cannot be separated, um, they argue, the intellectual production of individuals who behave violently must be interrogated for the links they, that may exist between the thought world of the writer and the violence committed. So they, they offer this method, um, another method, so different from the scholar I cited on the panel, where they say those who do read Yoder and Tillich must do so with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Because sexual violence perpetuates itself through silence, it is likewise necessary that those who continue to read and teach and otherwise engage the thought of sexually violent theologians regularly voice the fact of violence, prioritize pedagogical foci that contend with its implications, and do so in ways that intentionally express solidarity with the sexual violence survivors. So they offer this method, this way of reading so you have this debate of silence uh, silence and, and the principle of sin. And on the other end, you have this sense of you speak to it, but you have these guidelines in your method. I know, I know this is sensitive, but I want to say, how do we, how do we 
refuse to participate in violence supporting delinking of principles from practices, in gender violence supporting uh, delinking of principles and practices. And here's a method, a way of doing that. And one of the things we have to do is construct such a method and way of doing that. So not only do I have to speak to the sensitive and difficult pieces of the day that, that are ignored in, in my sort of, in this predominantly white audience, this is a reminder of, of, um, of April 4 and, and a reminder of where I am here at Notre Dame, but also a US context, right? And to remind you of the kind of historical narratives of racist gender violence that is expose the hypocrisies, right? Historical uh, narratives of racist gender violence that expose hypocrisies. And in some ways, the, the Thomas Jefferson example pulls it all together, right? Pulls it all together, both the tools we need, like I started out, the tools we need to think about how anti-violence anti work helps us to unpack anti-racism, the tools we need to directly address gender violence in, uh, and sexual violence in the pulling apart of principles uh, from practices. There are certain kinds of disruptive recollections of Thomas Jefferson that we need because they reveal how gender violence is racism. Our collective memory of US uh, <clears throat> broader society can serve as a crucial resource for a grasp on how gender violence is racism. In US history, I like to point to this uh, third US president, Thomas Jefferson, author of the elegant, just a reminder, our articulation of the moral impetus behind, behind the founding of this nation. Alongside of his 1776 Declaration of Independence assertion, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, unquote. Alongside of that declaration is the fact of his rape of his 14-year-old black slave, Sally Hemings. If acknowledged at all, the fact that Jefferson at about the age of 40 was a child rapist of his black 14 year old slave has come to be regarded as an ordinary occurrence that reflects normalized sexual relations for so many white male slaveholders within his context. It was just normal. Everybody did it. Most often this fact is not remembered, but simply dis disappears within the customary valorization of Jefferson. I wonder if in your uh, school's system, um, there is a discussion of Jefferson and the ways in which um, he raped his slave and fathered, I guess, six or five or six children with Hemings. Jefferson as the quintessential anti-colonial national hero who crafted culturally foundational language about human freedom and equality. And also note that with this invocation, um, there is an invocation of the creator as part of these iconic words. So there is this kind of religious imprimatur um, that's attached to this tradition of rape tolerance in US society. And I would say more broadly, the ways in which um, that rape tolerance is part of the reputation of of the US uh, broadly uh, across the world. No matter what your racial, ethnic, or national origins might be, all US community members inherit and are morally formed by this collective legacy. It becomes part of our memory. You see how I'm trying to argue? How does the hypocrisy become acceptable? It becomes part of our memory, the hypocrisy. Uh, and and this kind of valorization of Jefferson as, as a child rapist. And yes, I did talk about him as a child rapist at the University of Virginia. Um, and 
And and because not not to be salacious, but because to to say, how do we confront these legacies? It creates a memory that disciplines us in ignoring the harm of white racist gender violence. Right? How do you get so that it, it it's not traumatizing? Right? You just you, it's just the harm. You can't see it. You can't quite you can't quite feel it. You can't. It's not part of your collective memory that harm, the everydayness of gender violence. It teaches us gender violence. If you see it as gender violence, it's, well, don't see it as gender violence. It's not really violence violence. Like it's not part of peace studies. Come on. Peace studies is what men do to other men in public. Everyday intimate sexual violence everyday coercive control of domestic violence, that doesn't count in peace studies. No matter how many clergy, professors, doctors, assault, no matter how much assault, sexual violence, intimate violence occurs in prisons, in hospitals, among members of the military, how many femicides there are by abusers, how many femicides by mass killers, no matter how much acquaintance rape, how much marital rape occurs, how much targeting of LGBTQ people for sexual assault and sexual harassment due to gender nonconformity. That's not really peace studies, right? It's, it's ancillary. Even though even Augustine, even Augustine wrote about domestic violence by wives, uh, 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 by husbands against their wives. Augustine wrote about femicide, wrote about male rape of slaves, but it's his ideas about just war. That's, that's the tradition. That's the classical tradition we need to pay attention to. This Thomas Jefferson example reminds us how the whiteness in heterosexual rape is so under theorized, so under examined, especially by religion scholars. It teaches us about entitlement to sexually abuse. It teaches us about innate superiority of heterosexuality imbued in the US. And also it teaches us a kind of collective need to tolerate, to indulge, to rationalize man's private acts. That's inculcated in us as a bedrock, bedrock response, as a bedrock acceptance of hypocrisy. So we need more tools that allow us to disrupt those hypocrisies, to have methods that do so. And uh, we need transnational skills which uh, I'm not going to take time to talk about, but we need transnational skills that allow us to learn, especially those of us in the US, to learn from activists in other contexts. And we need imagination. We absolutely need imagination. We need imagination that allows us witnessing justice. It allows us to reach out with friendship. It allows us to encourage people, to represent, to prevent. It allows us compassion to be consistent. It allows us to oblige action, critical embodiment, to centralize dignity, to affirm dignity, to recognize diversity, to empower justice, to deconstruct hierarchies, to empower the most vulnerable. It allows us to be confrontational. We must lead, lead to action, disrupt hate. We must transform, absolutely transform accountability. We need values that condemn inequality, that make us able to change, to talk to each other, to upset silence, and much, much more. Thank you. So I, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to invite comments, questions. You have a, you have a, you have a closing. You're just transitioning us. No, no, we yes. Why don't we do that? No, no, we don't have time. No, no, we do, we do. We do have a few minutes for questions here before we head to the next room for making a fire. We'll definitely have a di dialogue in the next in the next room. But how about just an immediate? An immediate, just give me a little feedback, response, question, comment, something that came up for you. It just, I tried to leave a few moments for that. Please. Hi, um, thank you so much for this amazing lecture. I, um, I know that uh, you focus on the US context, uh, but actually what uh, came to my mind as you were talking is, um, sexual politics more broadly and internationally, and um, specifically, if you have any thoughts um, grounded in your research and your praxis about how accusations about race, uh, uh, rape um, are articulated uh, differently in reference to uh, um, the Hamas assault on October 7th and how and the reality of sexual violence in, let's say, um, you know, against Palestinian women. So how we, you know how it also operates in rela relation to um, Orientalism, Islamophobia, and so maybe an invitation to go outside of the United States, although it's still connected. Yes, yes. If you don't mind, can I just kind of affirm the need to make those connections, and 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 see if and and the ways in which. It's just crucial to what I, I was going to put up to how do we how do we translate like the local knowledge about rape and listen to that local knowledge and specifically uh, the Hamas Israel conflict, but specifically rape of Israelis, the rape of Palestinian. How what what are the stories and the context of um, the mass kind of, we just see this mass genocidal destruction of Palestine right at this moment, this slow starving to death of a million people, right? And then you put rape in that context, right? And the massiveness of rape and what kinds of tools do we need to stop it, prevent it? What are the historical, that's why the historical narratives are so crucial, right? So an invitation to make all of those kinds of connections. Thank you very much for your, your uh, lecture and appreciate your observations. It's, it's obviously important for you to focus, for us to focus and think about extreme forms of violence, sexual violence, violence against women, racism but for an audience like this we're already on board and so i worry that we see ourselves then as the righteous because we're not talking or thinking about the ordinary racism that imbues our lives that imbues this university that in, imbues our everyday existence in our own homes and in a way to focus on the extreme only lets us off the hook so it's pointing the finger at others that we all find objectionable whereas we need to be pointing the fingers at ourselves. So I'm saying this to set you up to point your finger at us. <laughs> I don't know. I thought I was doing a pretty good job of pointing my finger at you. So I'm kind of stumped. I was, I was doing my best to provoke a little something, something. Um, yeah, yeah. There is something so banal about both racism um, and gender violence. In, and I'm just using that as an umbrella term. Um, and, and, and so in some ways, I think um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to give examples of how those two work together more than I'm trying to say, go to an extreme example. So I didn't see myself as just talking about extremes, but, uh, but, I, but I received that critique and I need to think about that. Um, and and, and if, you, if, if you thought that I wasn't trying to say all of you have the same historical memory and racist kind of way you think of sort of US as exceptional. Like, yeah, there were some bad stuff that happened. 
I, I actually was thinking that all of us are complicit. I always say to my students, white supremacy is in here. I, white supremacy, I have learned my inferiority. I, and we produce, um, and we produce. So, so, so I actually, I do believe that. So I guess we have, we need to stop now because we're going to have more conversation and dialogue over there. But I wanted to at least ha have a moment and let you um, push back a little bit and have conversation. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I didn't get to all these wonderful verbs and nouns. Yeah, just one quick word of thanks about the pointed you, you put the places you pushed back at us. I actually thought that there were places there, including your critique of peace studies, which I want to push back at you. Good. <laughs> because the kind of peace studies that we do here at Croc, I think is very different than what you described in your presentation, but that may be part of the issues that we'll discuss uh, at our uh, dialogue. One more uh, thing, you started your presentation by suggesting that you may not be the right person for this. I think we need more of you here to actually have these conversations. So 